Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Effective Remote Work, an overview of Slack, Microsoft Teams, and Zoom. My name is Melissa Turk, and I'm the Associate Director for Academic and Professional Programs in CMU's Alumni Association. In my position, I assist our Alumni Association initiatives around career and professional development. We're happy to continue our series of CMU Connect webinars with today's event, and we hope that you'll enjoy this program and future events. Before we begin, I do have a couple of logistical notes. As always, I want to thank you in advance for your patience with any potential technical issues. If you do have technical difficulties, please visit support.zoom.us. You'll note that there's a Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Any questions or comments that you type will be visible to me and our presenter, but to no other attendees. Phil will be giving us a little bit of um, background on each platform, and then we'll spend most of the time doing the Q&A, but please feel free to submit your questions at any time throughout the presentation. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Phil Simon. Phil is a frequent keynote speaker, Slack trainer, and recognized technology authority. He is the award-winning author of nine management books, most recently Slack for Dummies. He's currently working on Zoom for Dummies. He's consulted with organizations on matters related to communication, strategy, data, and technology. His contributions have appeared in the Harvard Business Review, the New York Times, and many other publications. He currently serves as a full-time faculty member at Arizona State University's W.P. Kearney School of Business. He teaches courses on technology and analytics. Phil, thank you for joining us today to share your expertise. I will turn it over to you to get started. Thanks, Melissa. How's everyone doing today? Let's get ready to learn. All right, plan of attack for today, do a bit of an introduction. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the basics of Slack, Microsoft Teams, and Zoom. I'll also talk about some myths that people hold about these tools and some advice for getting started with each one, but I'd say that mm, 30, 35 minutes or so will be my answering your questions. A bit about me, again, I've written a bunch of books. I went to Carnegie Mellon a million years ago, at the Dietrich School, but back when I was there, they called it the Humanities and Social Sciences School, HNSS. Done a bunch of speaking, I show people how to use Slack, currently teach at a ridiculously large school in Arizona, and, Fun fact, my favorite show is Breaking Bad. So with a nod to Saul Goodman from Better Call Saul, it is showtime, folks. I'm a big fan of quote. I start off all of my lectures and all of my keynote talks with quotes. This is one of my faves from the British philosopher Thomas Carlyle, Tommy C. Man is a tool-using animal. Without tools, he is nothing. With tools, he is all. Let's talk about tools. Why are collaboration tools exploding in popularity? Some of you are fans of my favorite show might recognize this screen. Yes, I'm talking about the elephant in the room, COVID-19. I'm a big fan of data. Let's look at some. How have these tools increased in usage over the last two or three months? Oh, not that much. Zoom in particular went from 10 million daily active users at the end of 2019 to a little over 200 million users in March of this year. It is a 2,000% increase, which has led to some interesting challenges that they have been facing. I know that some of you will have questions on security. I can answer those in a bit, but trust me, it is a good problem to have, but it is still very much a problem. And I believe that Zoom may have touched 300 million users. Uh, some of you also may have noticed that Facebook recently launched something called Messenger Rooms with up to 50 people. Of course, you all have to be on Facebook, so people are doing a lot of video conferencing these days. There is something called Zoom fatigue. That is a thing, but let's get on to the um, basics of these types of things. By the way, um, I'll make the slides available later. I'm a big fan of citing my sources. Um, this is from the New York Times, but if you want to read the article, on how COVID-19 changed how we internet, there we go. Slack, let's get to the first tool today. A fun fact on Slack, the company started as a video game called Glitch. And the 
founders of the company could not get that video game to a certain level of popularity and they wound up pivoting to use the parlance of Silicon Valley. And they wound up with Slack, which stands for, wait for it, searchable log of all communications and knowledge. Is it apropos? Absolutely, but it is a bit of a contrived, what they call, backronym. And Slack is very popular, around 12 million daily active users. I am an enormous fan of Slack. I've been using it with my students for the last three years. And as I'm fond of saying, once you go Slack, you do not go back. Now, you may think it's just for startups, and you would be spectacularly wrong. Not that long ago, Slack announced that a little company called IBM went with Slack over Microsoft Teams for its 350,000 employees. That is the antithesis of a startup. Slack is a very popular tool that all sorts of people are using in all sorts of interesting ways. It can be a very large company like IBM. It can be an institution of higher learning. Or my neighbor uses Slack for her book club. And at the core of Slack is this notion of a channel. So one of the chief problems with email is that it's this bottomless inbox that anyone could send to a message to from anywhere and basically put something at the top of your to-do list. Yes, you can use filters and you can use folders, but those conversations aren't very targeted. Slack channels are buckets. So this is the workspace that I set up when I was writing Zoom for Dummies, and I can create a bucket, a channel for IT support or FAQ or marketing or any number of different things. Tomato, tomato? I don't think so. If I know that I'm getting a message from IT support, then I don't have to think, what is this about? And you might think, is that really a big deal? Trust me, people get on average 120 to 150 email messages per day. If you can save even five seconds on each one, figuring out what it's about, that is enormous. With my students, for instance, if I create a channel for group projects and they're in my workspace, this entire thing here in purple is a Slack workspace. And yes, you can change the colors if you like. I don't have to go back and forth with the student over email for example, saying, what course are you in? What assignment are you talking about? Again, the cognitive load, fancy term, that you need to process each message goes away. You immediately have valuable context about your message. That is incredibly invaluable. And you can set up as many channels as you like. You can also set up as many workspaces as you like. Right? So I've got them for all of my classes. I've got one for Slack for Dummies. I've got one that I use with my clients. I am an enormous fan of Slack. Now, some of you still might be thinking, I don't get it. Um, I'm a big fan of pop culture references. This is from the, I think it was 1987 or 88 movie, Big with Tom Hanks. Why not just use email, right? Well, lots of reasons, but I'll give you, in my opinion, the most valuable one. This is Stuart Butterfield. He seems happy, trust your instincts. He is the CEO of Slack. And while researching Slack for dummies, I came across an interview that he did that kind of blew my mind. So think about the problem with an inbox. Anyone can send you anything. And when you leave a company, that inbox effectively dies. All of those interactions, all of those decisions that you made, all of those key documents, poof, gone, never again. Yeah, the IT department may resurrect it, but for the most part, the email box is in um, is dead. So Butterfield envisions Slack as this engine. And when you throw in artificial learning, I'm sorry, artificial intelligence and machine learning, then in theory, Slack could learn a lot about your organization. I read an interview with Butterfield and he mentioned how Slack could be your always on chief of staff that answers questions you didn't think to ask. Boom, mind exploded when I read that. So think about this, if you're in an organization and let's say that uh, you're an entry level employee, you make $40,000 a year and your title as analyst is pretty basic, but in fact, you are invaluable to the organization. You're involved in all sorts of informal networks. Slack calls this its work threat. So it can visualize how you interact with people and you may get an offer for $50,000 and that's a pretty big raise if you're making 40. Well, rather than just telling your manager and having your manager say nice knowing you, I would take the raise too. What if you knew that 
that particular analyst was really valuable to the organization. In fact, that value to the company was a hell of a lot higher than 40 or even $50,000. You may not be able to max that offer, but wouldn't it be good to have that information? That is exactly what Slack is doing. And even though I'm no expert on machine learning, I do know this. Neural nets and all sorts of other tools that rely upon AI and machine learning need data. Well, if I communicate in Slack, we're going to be generating a lot of data. So this, among many ways, is a reason that Slack far exceeds email. Okay? And I learned a lot about this. This is my first shameless plug, Slack for dummies. I like to think that it isn't awful. Microsoft Teams, next up on the list. Conceptually, very similar to Slack. Now, to be fair, Microsoft has been around for a lot longer than Slack. I think that it's been around for a little over 40 years, which is pretty impressive when you think about tech companies. A lot of them don't last anywhere near that long. But over the years, as someone who started using Microsoft tools, actually at Carnegie Mellon a million years ago, Microsoft has added a number of tools. Uh, Link, Skype, Yammer, SharePoint. Right? And Microsoft Teams is actually a front end built on top of SharePoint. So the company, um, has a number of these different tools and they're trying to ultimately consolidate them. Now, Microsoft bundles Teams with Office 365, so if your organization pays for um, PowerPoint and Outlook and Microsoft Word and Excel, then guess what, you've got uh, Teams as well. But I would argue that Microsoft is not a best of breed tool. Slack only exists to make Slack. It doesn't make any other products. Microsoft, on the other hand, makes a ton of other products, whether it's Office or Windows or SQL Server or Azure or Xbox or any number of different things. Oh, no, by the way, they're in the hardware business with Surface. So Microsoft is really, if you think about it, more of a fast follower than a true pioneer. This is a lot like if you're familiar with the data visualization tool, Tableau. Tableau really focuses on data viz, and it's so good at it that Salesforce bought it for a little under $16 billion, I want to say about a year ago, give or take. Now, Microsoft makes a comparable tool called Power BI, and it's a useful tool. I use it to teach my students when I teach business intelligence. But Microsoft is very much a fast follower. They take a look at what Slack is doing or what Tableau is doing, and then they add that to their own products. So it just means that they're probably not pioneering as much as Slack would in this particular case. Okay, and you can come up with examples all day long. For instance, Microsoft Teams, up until very recently, didn't have private channels. So remember, channels are buckets of conversations about a particular topic, marketing, human resources, payroll, whatever. But they're public, so if you're in the workspace, then you can join them, right? But what if you don't want anyone to join them because you're talking about promotions or you're talking about uh, confidential information? So for a long time, Slack has shipped with private channels. Microsoft didn't. Well, guess what Microsoft added last year? You guessed it, private channels. Now, in terms of popularity, here's where it's a little bit misleading. Microsoft Teams actually sports a bunch of users, a lot more than Slack. However, this number is a bit janky because remember, Microsoft Office includes Teams. So Microsoft can say you're using Teams if you're using Office, whereas with Slack, again, you are very much using Slack independent. And Slack integrates with Office and all sorts of other things through apps. We can get to that later. But that number, again, take it with a little bit of salt. And Microsoft Teams looks very similar to Slack. The search bar up top here is, is very similar. I'm actually a guest in this particular Microsoft Teams instance. So as a guest, my features are limited. This is me going back and forth with my publisher on my book about all sorts of book related things. But again, I could use animated GIFs. And yes, I call them GIFs, not GIFs. I'm probably offending some of you because that is very much a holy war. I can use emojis. I can link to files. I can do all sorts of different things. But conceptually, it's very similar. I can also track activity. Um, if I want to see the people with whom I'm chatting, again, it makes it really easy. Uh, they have their quirks, but again, conceptually, there are contained workspaces to discuss certain things, in this case, the publication of one of my books. Okay. So benefits of using Slack and Teams, quite a few. Uh, for one, again, they reduce cognitive load. I know that if my Microsoft Teams instance lights up, it's someone with a question for me about one of my books. 
right? I don't have to go in the email and spend time figuring out why does this person send me a message? And again, that does add up. Um, they live on after employees leave organizations, right? And it's important to capture that knowledge. Um, even if you're just looking something up, never mind sophisticated things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. They are closed systems, and that is a good thing. In other words, you are inviting them into your home or into your office. Right? Yes, people can do bad things in Slack and in Microsoft Teams, and, and certainly in Zoom, which we'll get to in a bit. But I know that if it's one of my students, for example, right, sending me a message, right, I don't have to say you're not in my class, because otherwise they would never have been in the workspace. I also know that I can search my workspace Right, to find all my communications for all my students. I, have to know, I don't have to go back through email, which can be a bit cumbersome. They're all there. That is very valuable. And they serve as these living documents. Sometimes I'll look back at a previous semester and go, what was that cool Tableau tip I shared with my data viz students before? Oh yeah, there it is. Again, I can find things lickety-split. And they ultimately help these organizations build invaluable knowledge bases. What did we do? in the organization, how did we make that decision? What were some of the factors that went into it? Again, these things are incredibly valuable. I've read statistics that the average employee looks something like 20 or 30 minutes per day for key documents, which to me is um, amazing, right? We can Google trillions of web pages in half a second, but we can't find that freaking email from someone or that um, attachment. Moving on to Zoom, this is Eric Wan. He is also a pretty happy guy these days because when he left Cisco after Cisco bought one of the companies he worked for, WebEx, he had an idea to build a better video chat tool. Fun fact, he initially was working on the tool back in his days in China because he had to spend something like 12 hours on a train to visit his girlfriend. Well, who could have expected him to have this type of success here? We're doing this webinar on Zoom. Um, some of you have used Zoom personally or at work. And again, Zoom right now is the pretty girl at the dance, uh, something like 300 million users, give or take. Okay. And Zoom is certainly not the first video conferencing tool, but I'd argue it's the cleanest. It's got very low latency. They've done some cool things with the technology. They face some challenges and we'll get to those shortly, but Eric Wan started the company almost a decade ago now, and he was essentially fed up at Cisco because he knew what customers needed. Okay. Wan, wanted to build a tool that helped businesses do video conferences with other businesses. The folks at Zoom did not intend for this to get used by school teachers and priests and Pilates instructors. So they've had to make some changes to the core product because of Zoom bombing and some of the things you may have read about in the news. But this has wildly exceeded his dreams, uh, but now the company with great power has greater responsibility. Again, very much an enterprise focus. They did not envision this as a consumer tool. This is very much supposed to be a business to business or what they would call B2B tool. And again, thanks to COVID-19, uses is up a ridiculous percentage. That's one of the reasons that the publisher came back and said, hey, would you like to write Zoom for dummies? Okay. Uh, what does Zoom look like? Again, it has a lot of the same functionality. If I were to go into Zoom and under contacts, I can create channels, right? I can do meetings. I can have audio calls, video calls. Again, in Teams and in Slack, you can do audio and video calls too. Uh, Slack, I know, limits the number of concurrent users on a video call to 15. With Zoom, it hinges on your plan, but um, it's easily 500 or 1,000, and they even have a feature called large meetings in which um, some ridiculous number of people can attend. Again, I can send people simple Slack messages. I'm sorry, <laughs> tools get confusing sometimes. Simple text messages, right? I can find out when someone is active. I can um, call people on a telephone. Zoom also offers, unlike Slack and Teams, an actual phone. It's called VoIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol. If you're of a certain age, you may remember tools like Vonage. Now, you may not use your phone very much to actually call people, although that's actually making a comeback okay, based on COVID-19 and people craving some personal interaction. But there are plenty of businesses that still have a legitimate need for business lines. I certainly am not going to give my students my cell phone number. And if you work at a call center, right? So Zoom offers add-ons, things like webinars that we're doing now, phones, Zoom rooms, which are basically 
uh, what they call immersive telepresence. Uh, folks of a certain age remember, may remember Cisco's $300,000 tool, but it's kind of like doing virtual reality in a room. It's kind of a souped up training room. Okay. Um, speaking of which, I would be remiss, but uh, one of my favorite jokes about phones is from the comedian Gary Goldman. He says that a phone is just this seldom used app on his phone. Do these tools overlap? Another nod to one of my favorite movies, absolutely. There's actually quite a bit of overlap among these tools. Uh, first up, they include channels, right? Third-party apps. I can make a Zoom call in Slack. I could import Google Docs into Slack. I can, in Zoom, receive Google Calendar or Microsoft Outlook Calendar notifications. These are all optional, but these third-party apps allow me to be a lot more efficient. And this is all possible through open APIs or application program interfaces. Basically, they're hooks to connect different web services. If you've ever logged into, for instance, a website through your Gmail credentials or your Facebook credentials, you're really accessing an API there. Also, I'd argue you get what you pay for. Um, the free plans for Slack and Zoom, I think, are pretty robust. Um, if you wanted to do a webinar, you have to pay for it. If you wanted to do um, some of the more sophisticated security configurations, you'd have to go with a paid plan. But you know, generally speaking, when it comes to collaboration, folks of the 80s might recognize this reference. Um, anything that you use that I've talked about today is better than this madness. The idea that you can manage your life from your inbox, I think, is absolutely crazy. Uh, one of my other books, Message Not Received, is about why business communication typically fails. And this notion that we can do everything through email is absolutely insane. Now, Slack and Teams and Zoom don't obviate the need for email. Email, remember, those are closed systems. But for internal email, if you're using Slack, you would never send a colleague a message as an email. Um, you would want that to be in Slack. Now, I'm curious here, and there's going to be a poll in Zoom, but which tool do you use most? Melissa's going to post that here. See what we get for results here. Zoom in the lead. More than one, okay. Interesting. Okay. Great, okay. we'll get that Slack up there. All right, next up, um, myths about these tools. Um, that Slack or Microsoft Teams is just email 2.0. I could not disagree more. Again, if you only use Slack for messages, it's like, uh, again, another joke from that comedian Gary Goldman. It's like saying you're gonna use your Lexus convertible as a, an elaborate cup holder. You can send messages, but you can do a whole lot more. Also, you don't necessarily need to use all of these tools. I happen to use them because I'm writing books on two of them, and I will be the first to admit that sometimes I get a little bit confused because I've got different things going on in different tools, but. Um, it is not uncommon for people to use more than one, and you can conceivably just use one if you like. But there's another myth there that there's a single best tool. I am partial to Slack. I think it is fantastic. But if I have to use Microsoft Teams, as I do with my publisher, because they don't use Slack, then I will. Because again, all of those are better than email. They also don't obviate the need for in-person communication. Again, that's a little challenging these days because of social distancing, but I actually just had this discussion with some people at work. Um, often a five minute conversation makes an email chain or a Slack message chain or thread completely irrelevant. Um, sometimes I can come across as a little bit harsh, although I've been working on it over the years. But if we're having a video call just like in person, you can see my facial expressions, you can hear my tone of voice. Text does not come with that. In fact, it strips out a great deal of that context. Now imagine this. Say that you just met someone, you've been working with someone for a few weeks. You can have that misunderstanding. One of my favorite bands, Marillion, based out of the UK, has had disagreements over email and they've known each other for over 30 years. They've been to each other's weddings. So sometimes you really should pick up the phone or get on video conference with someone to go through uh, an issue. Um, also, don't try to drink from the fire hose. Um, trying to digest all these tools at once is quite frankly confusing. Try to do it a little bit at a time. You would not teach yourself Microsoft Office all at once. You might start with Excel or the basics or basics with email. Also, when you're going into a channel, read the room. 
In other words, um, if you're new to an organization and there are a thousand people on the channel, you may not want to post an inappropriate joke. However, if you are part of a private Slack channel with three or four of your knucklehead friends and make a joke that's a little on the borderline, you probably don't have to worry about that too much. But make no mistake, if your company pays for Zoom, that it is a company tool and you don't necessarily have a right to expect complete privacy. And that's an entire chapter in the book, but I'll just move on. Also, you get what you pay for. I got my animations out of order there. Whoops. Um, generally speaking, um, if you upgrade, you get more bells and whistles. Again, if I'm using a free Slack workspace for a test, that's fine. But if I were communicating with 500 people and they sent a lot of messages, one of the limitations of the Slack free plan is that I can only search the most, ten, the most recent 10,000 messages. So these, these tools are remarkably affordable. I'm old enough to remember in the mid 90s, companies would spend millions of dollars on implementations before they'd even see the product or people would get to use it. These days, thanks to cloud computing and software as a service, it is very easy for companies to get going. And from an accounting perspective, you're talking about what used to be a capital expense that you'd have to justify upfront with millions of dollars into typically a monthly operational expense, which is a lot easier for the bean counters to justify. If you're getting started with these new tools, here's a little bit more advice. Anything that you post is potentially public. If you put it in a Slack channel and it's a private one to boot, that doesn't stop someone from taking a screenshot. So I tell people when I do training or when they have questions about Slack, if you have any doubt about posting that image or that joke, don't do it because it would not be that difficult for someone to distribute that to someone else. And also, err on the side of caution. If you're not sure about something legally, you may want to ask your in-house attorneys or if it's something with HR, let's say you're dealing with a disciplinary issue, and there may be instances in which you might not want to put something in Slack. And as I'm fond of saying, it's not rocket surgery. Um, you can get the hang of this. Um, the Dummies book, I think, will help people who haven't understood all of Slack or, or, the, or Zoom. But if I can figure it out, and I did go to Carnegie Mellon, so I like to think that I'm reasonably intelligent, um, it's not that hard to figure out. You don't need to code to use these tools, although you can certainly do some cool things. I'm a fan of the programming language Python, and I've written some scripts that automate the creation of Slack channels, so I don't have to do it manually every semester. But there's a lot you can do with this, so start a little at a time, but you can figure it out. It really isn't that hard. All right, with a nod, to Pat Benatar for questions. Hit me with your best shot. Thanks, Phil. And we still have a lot of time to, to get those meds up to maybe answering some questions here. So um, thank you. I know when we talked about this, there's a lot of information on each platform and getting it into even just a 50 minute time frame is hard. So we'll do our best here um, to get the questions answered. So the first one goes to your that the first data slide that you had of you know zoom just soaring higher than a lot of the other platforms what do you think is attributed to that ease of use quality freedom of the plan um, again it's certainly not the only video tool that's out there but zoom was just remarkably easy to use um, i sound fond of saying it passes the, the the grandmother test so grandmothers tend to understand facebook they get it uh, twitter not so much so a lot of things, um, call quality, the fact that um, it was never really down, even though they experienced such rapid growth. They embraced cloud computing and, and data centers, services like Amazon Web Services, which are specifically designed to handle peaks in demand. If Zoom had gone down, kind of like the early days of Facebook, people of a certain age re may remember Friendster, which was one of the early social networks. Great idea. Why haven't you heard of it, probably? Because it was always down. It was so popular, they couldn't handle it. Mark Zuckerberg has made a lot of mistakes in his day, but one of them is certainly not understanding the need for the service to be reliable from the beginning. And Facebook rarely, if ever, has gone down. So a lot of different reasons for it. Um, again, certainly not the only tool out there. There are probably two or three other dozen tools that I mentioned in Zoom for Dummies. Perfect. And then kind of on that same note, you mentioned that Zoom was really built for B2B. Um, what issues has Zoom have with home customers versus the B2B experience they expected? 
Well, lots of things. Um, again, with 10 million users, and if the company used it internally, perhaps they required employees to log in through a VPN. They certainly wouldn't publish their personal meeting IDs or their links. But once people started doing it, saying anyone could show up to my class or I'm going to be holding an online concert or Pilates, okay, people made these things available so other people could use them, right? That was the whole point. But then you heard about on the dark web or sites like 4chan, people were writing down someone's personal meeting ID or the personal meeting ID wasn't that long or it wasn't um, a combination of uh, letters and numbers, which meant that it was easier for people to guess. So again, it's a problem and it's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem. And I will say this about Zoom. Uh, once this became apparent that this was a big deal and then um, some schools stopped using it and in the New York City, school districts banned students from using it because of privacy issues, Zoom immediately announced a 90-day feature freeze and they have been shoring up security big time. They're not looking at anything else other than security right now because they realize that they don't want to get sued, that there are other tools that are out there, and that their brand matters. In fact, their reaction has been very similar to what Johnson & Johnson did back in, I think it was 1982, when some lunatic was lacing Tylenol with cyanide and people were dying. The Tylenol did not just take, I'm sorry, Johnson & Johnson did not just take Tylenol off the shelf in a number of stores. It cleared them out nationwide. And now when people think of Tylenol, they think of trust. And that is a case study in business schools on crisis management, right? Overcorrect, overcorrect. And I think that's exactly what Zoom is doing here. So uh, Zoom isn't fundamentally unsafe. Nothing is completely safe. Now Slack, and I believe Microsoft Teams for text-based communications practices end-to-end -end encryption, which means that even if you intercept a, mes a message in route, you can't decipher it because it's a bunch of gobbledygook. It's called ciphertext. My understanding is that you can't do that with video calls. And Slack, I'm sorry, Zoom uses a slightly different type of encryption. But hindsight's always 20-20. Um, I think we can only judge a company on how it's reacting to this. Mm -hmm. and I think it's been reacting really well, taking it really seriously. In fact, uh, one of the things I recommend to people who are new to Zoom, make sure that you turn on your updates because Zoom is announcing updates sometimes twice a week. And if you don't update your software, then you're not going to be able to take advantage of them. Thanks. And then you mentioned, um, you know, you use Slack a lot for course management of communicating with your students. Are yes. there things around FERPA protections? It seems like we have some other um, faculty or, or teachers in the room that might have. Yeah, that. that's, that's a great question. Um, my understanding since my employer, Arizona State, is one of the first and certainly one of the largest schools to use Slack enterprise wide, that it is FERPA compliant. Um, but you would certainly want to check with people at your school because they may hold to it different standard or they may be in a different country but um, I would not be out there bragging that I'm using slack with my students if that would get me in trouble <laughs> so I, I I'm no expert on FERPA but my understanding is that uh, we're good Perfect. and you know someone asked why we're using zoom on this instead of the slack for this webinar but that's the preferred platform right now for for Carnegie Mellon and the alumni association so just to kind of clear that up but well, actually most if I could you can't yep. have a what are there, 135 people on? Yeah, yep. Yeah, you couldn't do that with native Slack. Um, the cap is 15, and even with screen sharing. Um, so in, Zoom, in Slack, up until January of 2019, if you paid for a premium plan, then not only could I see your screen, but I could control your screen with your permission, of course. Um, Slack got away from that on purpose because so many Slack customers use Zoom and vice versa. So I can share my screen, in Slack, but you can't control it. But you can do that in Zoom. And Zoom offers a webinar product like a lot of companies do, Slack does not. So we could not do this in Slack. Another benefit of Zoom in this particular case in relation to Slack is that I didn't all have to invite 135 people to my workspace. Mm -hmm. This webinar is a discrete event, right? It's probably not something we're going to continue down the road. So if you were using Zoom webinars or you wanted to make the occasional Zoom call to your mother that's fine and you can add zoom contacts and send zoom chat messages and all that but if you're really collaborating on a project you could do it in zoom but you would want to use something like slack because there's this ongoing communication it's not discrete does that make sense yep sure does
Um, going through here, we have some logistical uh, Zoom questions here of, you know, I think people are enjoying the calmingness of your, your beach in the background and the fact that we can see the <laughs> waves moving up. Um, how you do you have a little bit of insight on how you did how you did that um i'm there sure if you think really hard i'm kidding <laughs> i'm a mac person if you launch the zoom desktop client and you hit command comma or control comma or just bring it up in preferences you can access virtual backgrounds and i'm a fan of them you can it, use the canned zoom ones so i think um one of the ones is in space there's another one uh, in which you're in front of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, in the past, I put myself on the court with the Golden State Warriors, or um, right now, I'm, although I'm in outside of Phoenix, Arizona, I figured calm blue oceans, so you can even upload um, short videos and have them in the background. Now, the quality of the um, video will vary. I don't have a green screen behind me. Uh, my computer is not the newest, although it's pretty powerful, so you might see some for lack of a better term, uh, latency, or it, it may not be entirely pure. But if you were to buy a green screen and $150 external uh, camera, then you can really project like you might have seen with some of the talk shows like last week tonight, or I know when Brad Pitt was on Saturday Night Live recently playing um, Dr. Fauci, um, you can actually create a cool custom background. But I don't have a green screen or a camera. I just use Google zoom virtual backgrounds and you'll be annoyed that i told you that because you're going to waste an hour but it's a lot of fun perfect i'm trying to we have a lot of questions coming through which is great um let's see here um, best suggestions for online re resources and how to get your staff up to speed on Teams. That seems to be their organization's choice of platform. Yeah, again, it's certainly a popular one. Um, there's Zoom for Dummies that just came out. Um, I did not write that one, but um, some people like the comfort of reading a book. Um, Zoom's, I'm sorry, Microsoft Teams has got all sorts of videos online. Um, even if you go to dummies.com, you can type in um, Microsoft Teams and get a cheat sheet. Um, I mean, YouTube channels, I, there's no shortage of resources and all the dummies books at the end, they've got a part of tens and, and both for Zoom and Slack for dummies. I did not have a hard time filling out the chapter of 10 great Zoom or 10 great Slack uh, resources. So there are lots of uh, interesting and valuable sites out there. Uh, Microsoft is technically ahead if you look at daily active users but they realize that there's this enormous opportunity here again collaboration tools have been around for a long time in fact going back to 1988 there was something called irc or internet relay chat that used this concept of channels and yeah they had that when i was at carnegie mellon but i'm totally dating myself but so many great resources that are out there um, i am not as familiar with teams but i would be astonished if microsoft didn't include a ton of videos and how-to guides and directions on the website. Um, and then some Slack specific questions. Um, I mean, you meant, I mean, I guess this goes with Microsoft Teams as well, but you mentioned that you can take these resources with you, right? It goes to your name, but how yes. does the organization keep the content? Maybe clarify that, that piece. Okay, I am going to go into Slack here for a second and do a new share, boom. All right, so for this particular workspace here, this belongs to me, right? I am the owner, right? And I can verify that here. Um, I am the, you know, I control this. Um, but with some of these other workspaces, right? Maybe ones with ASU logos, I don't own them, right? So I can't take them with me. I, I, an admin could say lock down my email address, whereas for me here, I, I, I own it. I am king of this workspace, so I can give people different roles. You can do the same thing with Zoom. You can do the same thing with Microsoft Teams. But yes, you absolutely want to be, by the way, Melissa and I were going back and forth on Slack. <laughs> right? So we could, we could share documents and um, PDFs, and I'm pretty sure I, I used animate, yeah, animated GIFs. There's Brad Pitt. 
I've um, been learning a lot about Slack through this. <laughs> so and you can really do the same nice. thing in Zoom and the same thing with Microsoft Teams. So yeah, back when we started over email, I said, you know, if we're going to be doing this over collaboration tools, we very much should use one of them. And again, my, my preference is uh, Slack. But, you know, I can see you know, all of this here is my conversation with Melissa. And I even created a channel for her, CNU Baby. Um, and these are um, actually, this was for um, some real estate stuff that um, I'll talk about right now. But um, yeah, I can, and then as I said, I can integrate different apps. So I can make a call in Zoom from Slack. I can have uh, my Trello updates, and Trello is a very cool um, project management tool. If you've ever heard of Kanban boards, Trello makes it really easy to see the status of a particular project. Or I could have my Google Drive uh, notifications come here because I don't want an email saying that uh, Melissa responded to my comment. I'd rather it just shows up in Slack, again, reducing cognitive load. But to get back to the question, you can create your own workspace, right? It's very easy to do. You just go to slack.com and walk yourself through it. And I encourage people to play around, certainly for Slack for dummies. And these are some of the screenshots that are in the book. I had some fun with Breaking Bad, but I couldn't use the actors' uh, real faces. Um, but I, you know, I created all sorts of channels and, and installed all sorts of apps and simulated back and forth. So this is just a private channel because you see the little lock there. Right. If I wanted Melissa to be part of this workspace, I'd have to also invite her to this channel because it is private. So yeah, very much err on the side of privacy, especially if you're new. You don't want to post something that gets you in trouble. Use your, use your imagination there because you didn't understand the difference between a public channel, right, like lab or a private channel like announcements. While you're in Slack, we'll get some, some of these questions up through. Um, someone talked about emojis and oh, yeah. adding different, like maybe more than just your basic emojis. Um, oh yeah, that's easy. Um, if you were to click, um, so let's, um, let's do it this way. Uh, I don't want to lose the, um, all right, I'll just show you how to do it, but it, uh, I don't want to lose the screen share. But if I click here and add emoji, then I can basically upload one and give it a name. Right, so I'll just show you a custom one that I created because I'm a big Breaking Bad fan. Is that not showing up there? Okay, I thought I created Breaking Bad for here. Um, so anyway, if you were to create your own and give it a name, then boom, you've got red. But yeah, it's very easy to do. Um, add emoji here, walk through it, and as long as it, you can't use something that's taken. So if I, I think boom is taken, yeah, it won't let me, but if I did boom too, right? So it just has to be unique, but yes, you can absolutely add custom emojis. And then I can I can see where they're they're talking about. You have lots of different teams or different um, yep. things. How do you keep organized? What's the best way? I mean, I can just see all yours. Uh, that even you know in emails, you can kind of sort them through boxes and things like that. What's your right. what you there? Well, I'll tell you what. Just to see notification, uh, Melissa, you want to send me a Slack message, or is that going to cause problems for you? No, I think I should be able to do that. Let me. All right, so I'm working, right? All of a sudden. Oops, hang on a second. I might have paused it. Um, we'll think. Okay, hang on one second. It could be anything. There you yep. Go. So now I got a message from Melissa. Now, I don't have to do anything, right? I can quit Slack. Right. If I'm focusing on writing and don't want to be bothered, but think about this. I've got a notification here. Right. I can choose to ignore it. Um, if I wanted to pause, I'm set here to active. I could change that. Boom. I'm away. I could update my status. So I'm a fan of um, OTG or off the grid. And then I'll put here for the oct. Yep. And then anyone could see, right, that I'm off the grid here. Now they can still try to contact me and that's an entirely different discussion, but so I try to manage expectations with folks. I can also pause notifications at any point, right? I don't wanna be bothered even though I still have Slack open. But it, it can be a little overwhelming, but I'll say this, if, if one of these lights up, let's say the Slack for Dummies one did, I know that someone has a question about Slack for Dummies and that might not be important to me, right? So I can easily, pause notifications just on this workspace. You're, you're right about email, right? It's one big thing, but you, it, the, the conceit there is that all communications are equal, right? Now, if it's an email from me, you might not think I'm that important and I can take it, I'm a big boy, 
But if it's an email from your boss or from the president of Carnegie Mellon, you might want to answer that one. <laughs> right? So it actually helps because you can create your own hierarchy. And there are a lot of workspaces here. For example, with this one, I turned off notifications. I just want a soft one here, the Slack Champion Network. This is just a bunch of other Slack smart cookies. We'll exchange ideas. Hey, have you thought about this? What have you done about that? So I can easily sign out of that workspace, pause notifications on that workspace. I'm in control. With your inbox, I would argue everyone else is in control of you. In fact, it even gets better with notifications so you're not overwhelmed. Let's say I go, Melissa, you're, you're driving me crazy here. I'm gonna go here under details, information, where did that go? Click more here. I can mute this conversation, right? So I'm not gonna get notifications from you, right? And I may set myself a reminder to unmute you in a while. Or what if I don't wanna mute Melissa the person? What if I go back to my channels here and I've got um, some website stuff going on? I wanna mute the entire channel, right? I can hear mute, the website Phil Simon, right? So I won't get notifications for just that channel and the people who post in that channel. So you have an unprecedented level of control over your notifications and we haven't even talked about your phone yet. So I like the fact that I can decide how much I wanna receive and when I wanna receive it versus an inbox in which it really could be anyone, as long as they're not blocked or in spam, send you any message about anything. I, I love being in control. Mm -hmm. Julia there. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time on Slack, but we have, we have a few more questions. Um, two that came up multiple times is you mentioned the cell phone notification, if you can show that. And then the second one is how do you um, add apps into um, that, those third party apps into it? And then we'll kind of move on from Slack from there. But I like Slack. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the questions are. So, you know, yeah, apps are easy. You click on apps. Uh, you can, I mean, these are just, I already have Jiffy installed, but if I wanted to, I'm a big fan of pocket. Let me install that one. So it um, looks like I have that one open, but you just, uh, pocket lets you kind of like temporary bookmarks. Oh, that's a cool article, but I don't have time for it now. I'm going to put it in my quote unquote pocket, but no, just click on apps. And you know, if you, uh, Slack's got over 2000 apps, Microsoft teams, isn't even a fraction of that. I think it's about 200. I know Zoom's about 200, but they're adding more all the time. But it, you know, if I wanted to bring my tweets into Slack or into a Slack channel, I could do that. Or my Outlook calendar. Or if I wanted to do polls, I'm a big fan of polls. Um, it's very simple if I wanted to. I installed Simple Poll. So I'll go into the Phil Simon one here and I'm gonna post in the, where's the, um, were we, I don't think we were working in the channel. But if I wanted to post here into quick links, I can do poll, um, how are you, right? And then do yes, and then or fine, or meh, that should work. Boom, so now there's a poll and people could vote within Slack, which is great for making decisions. The other question was around phones, mm -hmm. and I'm just gonna go back here to another channel. Um, it's fine. Um, so you determine in some cases if I go to preferences, notifications, how I want to be disturbed, um, but you can even do things like customize the device on which you'll be notified. You can customize keywords, right? If someone mentions marketing, I want to know about it. And you can do all sorts of things on phones, including see nothing. So again, to the extent that I like to be in control, if I'm at the gym, back when people used to go to gyms, hopefully that's coming back. Um, I can choose to go into Slack and I'll see my notifications, but I specifically on my iPhone don't want it bothering me because effectively, whether you're doing email, Slack, Zoom, Teams, whatever, the more that you respond to people, the more that you are implicitly training that you'll respond immediately. And if you want people to think that, then great, but I specifically don't. So I configure my phone in such a way that I don't get Slack notifications, but if you wanted to make your tablet or your phone do different things, that would be really easy. So one of the reasons I wrote the book is that I think a lot of people like anything else only use 20% of the functionality. I've met colleagues who say Slack is just email and I just shake my head because it isn't, but that's all they understand. So again, if you feel like you're getting overwhelmed, you may want to play around with notifications because you might say, for instance, I don't want to be notified about anything. 
in which case, fine, right? This is not going to annoy me in the Slack champion network because of my notification settings, but occasionally I'll peruse, right? And go, oh, what's going on over here? But for my students, I haven't set that up because even though I only check it a little um, infrequently, um, they're higher up on the pecking order than kind of an optional Slack workspace. Thanks. So we have a lot of different questions in here about other platforms like BlueJeans and Skype and OneNote and Google Hangouts. And I guess, um, you know, why these three tools? I know we talked, obviously, time is a huge answer to that one, um, you know, the time. But what are about these three product products that really um, make them the ones to talk about right now? Well, again, there are similar ones like it, and it's, it's a difficult question to answer because some tools are popular because they're popular. Uh, in both books, I write about network effects. And in a nutshell, if I'm the only person who uses Slack, then it's useless, right? Because I can't communicate with anyone, and no one can, can communicate with me. Excuse me. Ditto for telephones, right? I'm the only person with a telephone. Irrelevant. But what if, Melissa, you and I have a telephone? Okay, we can call each other. What if everyone on this webinar had a telephone? Okay, that is used. So, uh, according to Metcalf's law, the more people in a network, it exponentially increases its value. So, Facebook is a lot more valuable than Twitter because Facebook has, I believe, 2.4 billion users, give or take. Whereas Twitter, last time I checked, was about 320 million. So, the fact that these tools have gotten so popular means that other people want to use them. Right? If no one used Zoom, other people wouldn't use Zoom. It's kind of reflexive and it's a bit um, of a tautology, but I don't know why they became popular because other tools have existed. In a way though, it doesn't matter because they are popular and it would not be difficult for another company to create a tool like Slack or Teams or Zoom, right? I mean, again, it's not because I'm fond of saying rocket surgery, but the fact that you know, people are on Teams or they're on Zoom or Slack means that there's a level of acceptance. The other interesting thing, going back to apps, is that because apps exist, right, developers want to build more apps, right? It's popular, they build apps, it becomes more popular. In fact, there's even going to be a Zoom app for Microsoft Teams, the same way there's a Zoom app for, I'm sorry, a, a Slack app for Microsoft Teams, although there pretty much is an app for just about everything. Um, kind of like when um, BlackBerry was paying developers $10,000 to build apps before BlackBerry became irrelevant, they were trying to replicate the success of Android and iOS. So that's easier said than done. But I can't say that these are objectively the best tools. There may be one out there that's better in some way. But you also have to think about popularity and security, right? If a tool is kind of under the radar, then are other people not really paying attention to it? You know, if Slack has, I'm sorry, Zoom has experienced a bunch of problems, it's because that's where everyone's going. So short answer is I'm not that smart. But these are certainly three of the most popular collaboration tools, but by no means, unless are they the only three. Yep, I agree with that. Um, and then I know we only have a few minutes left, and I'm sorry to throw this, this bomb your way, but the security question came up a lot. Um, and I know we had some pre ones in there. And so just, you know, I know you talked about Zoom specifically because of the huge um, media that's going around it, but they've obviously have upgrades. Um, so make sure you upgrade, like you said, but in accordance the other two platforms can you talk on uh, touch base about security yeah i mean slack again end-to-end -end encryption um which is pretty military grade and i think it was um built on some of the same technology that snowden used with um, the prism scandal broke and microsoft also takes security very seriously now again are these things completely hack proof no um, is it possible particularly when you're dealing with third-party apps that you are introducing the risk into an organization sure it's possible Right? When I signed up for Zoom, I mean, I quit Facebook over two years ago. That's a different story. But I specifically didn't sign in with my, my other credentials. Right? I just kept it kind of church and state separated. Um, but you know, these companies take security re really seriously because they want to avoid bad press. They want to avoid lawsuits. And they realize that you know, MySpace used to have 70 million users. Right? And poof, nothing. Um, people are going to jump off of tools if they don't think that they are secure, but uh, I recommend, I, I just finished writing this part of the chapter for the Zoom book, but it's in the Slack book as well, enabling what they call two-factor authentication. For those of you who don't know that, it, you can log in with your username and password, that's one factor, but to the extent that a lot of times sites get hacked, 
sites like Facebook and, and Google with Gmail or, or Amazon enable two-factor authentication. So if I make Zoom, for example, send me a separate code, then I'm able to confirm that I'm me because it goes to my phone. And that reduces the chance that you get hacked, but it doesn't eliminate it because hackers are particularly clever. And there's something called SIM swapping. So they will purchase a different SIM card and they will call AT&T or Verizon and say, I am Phil Simon, um, I lost my phone, can you reset it and send it here? So again, there's no such thing as complete security when I teach introduction to information systems. I'm big on saying that security is a process, not an outcome. But the number one weapon you all have, kind of wrapping up here, is this thing in between your ears. It is your brain, right? Make, sure, make certain about what you're doing. Um, ask yourself, is this really true? Uh, but there are a lot of steps that you can use to make these tools as secure as possible. But if you're waiting for 100% security, nothing can ever happen. You're going to be waiting a long time because you know, John Chambers, uh, former CEO of Cisco Systems, said a few years ago, there are two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that don't know it yet. Um, but it, you definitely can take some steps to make your communications as secure as possible, even if they add a little bit of friction to the process. Thank you. And thank you so much for all the questions that were sent through. I know we did not get to all of them. Um, the time went by so fast. Um, and, but thank you, Phil, for your expertise and, and all the information you were able to share. And I love that you were actually able to go into Slack and kind of show us live. Twist um, my heart. If you want to connect, uh, connect with me, here you go. Perfect. Um, I will, this is being recorded, we get it captioned. So next week sometime, we will be sending that out along with the PowerPoint. Uh, and then I'll have some resources in the follow-up email. There's past webinars that we've done that answer some of the questions like um, lighting and video and those types of things. So those will be included in the follow-up email. Thank you all for joining us um, and make a great rest of the week. Thank you again, Phil. Thank you.